No, that's the bell. That was not the five minute bell, that is the bell. Discipline here is definitely old school. <laughs> I expect excellent behavior, and you know as well as I do that if I have any trouble with you here, there will be double trouble when you get home. <laughs> so if we understand each other, I think we should be ready to begin. <laughs> I've been in practice. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to our presentation today. And I uh, wanted to just open with that to uh, give us kind of a semblance. And you'll see in a few minutes why uh, that particular uh, stance and is something that's important to education in a school like St. Jacoby had. And it's also important to recognize because this was billed, I don't have it on this marquee, but it was billed as noticing obser observations of change in education over the years. Okay, so, and you know, we might look back as we change our view of use of law and gospel over the years. I think that years into my teaching ministry at St. Jacoby, uh, you run into people who said, oh, wow. I mean, maybe if this were current day, some of you might go home and say, oh my goodness, he yelled at us, something's wrong. Uh, and that isn't how it started out. Okay, now, you may, oh, okay. <laughs> we'll be in touch with your parents. All right, <laughs> you might have noticed that I put up uh, signs over by the display table over there, uh, and I just took the liberty to pop them in the windows. Um, and today we, you know, we see signs like that, but how important, and you remember from our kickoff sermon uh, on the 150th anniversary, how important the legacy of education was to the founders, our ancestors at St. Jacoby, when they established the school, because four weeks after the first people met, with some of the people at St. Peter's. Four weeks after that time, they already talked about a school. Uh, 1873, founding of the church. Four weeks later, uh, authorized the start of its own Christian day school. Now that demonstrates a love in their hearts for Christian education, and, and isn't it something that all these years later, 150 years later, we're making signs to put in our yard that say, we love our school, and our founders loved our school as well. And so that's kind of a heartwarming and faith-demonstrating way to see what our ancestors did and how important. There's a, there's a little uh, thing on the display table over there that says, uh, do we really need a Christian day school? Um, and here is one of the reasons, and I think in that kickoff sermon, it talked about the legacy that uh, Christian education has rendered us in blessings for this whole 150 years already. All right, so getting on then with how did they go about making these plans, it's always one thing to have a dream, but uh, somebody has to do something about it. So 
our first school building uh, shows a blacksmith shop. In May of 1873, the congregation purchased that blacksmith shop to be at school. The cost was $100. Um, so we're not real sure. The blacksmith shop is pictured in all kinds of our anniversary books and in albums and so on, but we're not positively sure uh, you know where exactly that was, but it appears like it was behind our, and if this picture is the authentic one or not. But uh, there's a little confusion too because uh, Milwaukee rerouted its streets. It talks about uh, a blacksmith shop on 6th and Mitchell. Well, our church was on 13th and Mitchell. And, but the city redid its, its configuration of streets about that time, and all of a sudden, uh, there was our address became 13th and Mitchell. So, uh, if this isn't the exact one, then it's certainly one like it. All right, and you know, I didn't mention as we're about to begin, um, I think everybody probably saw the handout on the table. Did everybody get that? Okay, because if you didn't, you could just pick it up right on the... the and I, the handout is not one that uh, I plan to, to follow. It's not part of the presentation. My PowerPoint is the presentation, but the handout has some interesting things on it that we might refer to uh, as we go along. And of course, if anybody has, and, and unlike old school, anything that you see, notice, uh, by all means, interrupt and, and give us a, a clue. Share whatever uh, at any time during the presentation. Uh, I can be really flexible with that, even though it's not old school, okay? All right, so there's a, a larger picture of that, the inside of it. Now, you see, that, that required a little bit of renovation to make a school out of that. Um, so uh, I don't know if they put up drop ceilings and fluorescent lights or what, but uh, I don't have a picture of how it was after it was renovated. But um, moving forward, then the congregation bought land. They bought a city block at 13th and Mitchell, authorized the building of a new church for the plan of $6,000, and the cornerstone was laid in June of 1873. Now. Some of you, you know, this is about education. And, you know, I looked at two ways to do this. We could, uh, I have stuff in here. I even have a model of the old church on the table over there. And you're thinking, well, this isn't, that's not school. This is about school. But do you know what? It's a, a good illustration of how the interweaving you cannot separate, and in all of our history at St. Jacoby, uh, the school was never a separate entity, something we did on the side. It was woven in and definitely a part of all of the things that we did to bring uh, Christian education, to bring Christ to the kids of our congregation. Uh, so I've got stuff in here, and even on the sheet, uh, timelines that include stuff that happened at the church because the church was such an integral part of what was happening in the school. They were the people who drove what happened in the school and how education, Christian education, developed throughout the years of our history. So I'm going to mix in some of the things that happened with the church as well. So. Okay, so, so far they buy a city block for $3,000. They buy a blacksmith shop for $100. And now they're planning a new church and that was dedicated or the cornerstone was laid in 1873. And that's a picture of the church and I think I have a, a little larger one for you to be able to see there. Uh, that is the first church and it said in some of the anniversary documentation and stuff that uh, this building that you see right behind the church, that 
was believed to be the blacksmith shop. Now, uh, I couldn't tell you because I wasn't, I'm old, but I wasn't there. Uh, but anyway, uh, that kind of gives you an idea. It was part and parcel of that first setup. All right, then our first teacher, Albert Bearwald, he began teaching our kids at age 19. He was a principal for 12 years. That was from 1873 to 1885. Okay, he maybe looks a little more old school than I do even. Uh, no? Oh, okay then. <laughs> okay, enrollment on the first day. Opened the doors of that blacksmith shop that was renovated. 57 kids showed up. And I guess this was a one-room school. One month later, he had 72 in that room. 12 months later, he had 103 in a one-room school. All eight grades, it appears. But we'll discuss something about all eight grades in the future. We have a little bit of lack of documentation about it because they didn't go by grades. I'm going to move this so I can put this here. Okay, they didn't go by grades like we say, okay, first grade through fourth grade or fifth grade through ninth grade or whatever. They had class one, which would be this, class two when they added a second teacher, class three when they added a third teacher, and class four when they added a fourth teacher. But all of the documentation that I found wasn't spelling that out in terms of grade levels. It just called it class one, two, three, and four until later in history it started talking about, about grade levels. Okay, so, yes, Sharon. They worship, no, you didn't miss it. It's because I didn't say it. Uh, and they worshiped in that same blacksmith shop was a worship place for the couple of months until that church that I pictured was built. So it's likely that when they renovated this, the, fa the fathers, the founding fathers, uh, met, I'm sure they met, I know there's some documentation about meeting in the parsonage of uh, some and some people's homes to do the founding work and so on, but this was a worship space as well. And only for a few months though, they, the new church went up uh, shortly after that within the same year. Okay, it, you know, when you have 107 kids in a one-room school, it kind of, meet, you know, they probably got short of space. And they needed to have an addition to that school. And that addition was $654, kind of a, uh, somehow they made two rooms out of it or something, and they called a second teacher. Okay, and anybody, feel free to stop. If you've got something to add, uh, let me know. Dennis. Classes. Classes. At that time, what was the public school the same? One, two, three, four? Or did they have grades? What? I think the public school, uh, the documentation there shows more grades. I think the formation here, now this is only my, I'm guessing because I don't have formal documentation, but uh, the public school system went in grades, and there's some talk at somewhere along the way that says, well, there was a, a transition issue when kids graduated from our school, then going into the public school was sometimes an issue, uh, and maybe part of that was because our grade levels weren't quite the same as theirs. John.
right. Yeah, I think there was a, a little bit of a, a difference there, a rift between how we did things and how the public school did things. And that caused, sometimes caused problems for graduates of our school uh, at some points in our history uh, because they felt, the public school felt that the level of education that we had was not par to what, when a student was supposed to go into ninth grade and they had grades definitely in, in the public school system. So, Rich. What was the fall procedure back then? I don't know, but I'm gonna assume, I, it appeared, and no one ever says they had a, they said they called, they, the congregation officially called the person. Now, maybe some of the pastors here would know more when our call system actually started. I mean, this is only, we aren't part of Wells yet. So I think the the procedure would have been the same, but, you know, we didn't join Wells until a number of years later. Wells was founded in 1850, and we didn't join at the minute that we started our history. So um, I can't tell you. Any of the pastors, you guys know? Um, pastor? Yeah, I, that's what I kind of assumed because the, the, the wording is always the congregation called another teacher. Never says hired, never says, you know, just like we use today, um, we call a teacher into service. Um, so it looks like the divine call method was there early on. Any other comments? Rich? Where did they call us from? Was there a teacher school? Well... Yes, one of our teachers, I think it was Kirschman, that uh, taught in Worms, Germany prior to coming here. Uh, some of them uh, that we called were teaching in other locations around the city. So I kind of look at it like this. Uh, when we call somebody, uh, you know, when we need a kind of something that doesn't fit the whole call structure and we need this and it's not available because of the parameters of the job description, sometimes we propose a name and say this person could do this for us and we ask the voters to add them to our call list or put them on our call list or sometimes we have a one person call list. So they may have known about Albert Bearwald locally or as part of the church and they said this guy would have the the wherewithal to do what we want him to do. And then they went to the Lord and said, we would like to call this person. It may not have been that there was a whole list of people to choose from like we do today. John. And she was the wife of, of the past. A, a, when she was called, I think they called him the former pastor. So, daughter. or daughter. Oh, I, oh, really? I was thinking it was his wife, but whatever. Uh, you know, when someone was available, uh, people went to the Lord and said, we have someone here. Will the voters accept and make the call? Dennis. Was the school in English? Or German? Oh, in German. Yes. Okay, we'll talk about that a little further on if we ever get going here. Okay, second school building, 1881. The congregation still has a debt from the old church, uh, from the church that we pictured earlier. Uh, 8% was the going rate to pay off the debt. And it might be mentioned here that most of the people were not wealthy people. They had to struggle just to... You know, the question, how much should we give? Uh, many people had to sacrifice, in or, sacrifice things like food and clothing in order to be able to get behind a project like this. Again, shows the love that 
was they were blessed with for Christian education uh, because under the circumstances, they could have said, well, we don't have the wherewithal to do this, so forget it, but they did it anyway. Uh, patterned after St. Peter's School, that school that's pictured there, um, cost $8,917. It was dedicated the very next year, 1881. Okay, um, four classrooms and a basement. Okay, so it is, you can see on either side, left and right, two classrooms on the first floor, two classrooms on the second floor, and then there was a basement. At first, the basement was just kind of a catch-all for the janitor stuff, and then later on was renovated. We'll come to that. Um, there's another view of it. Okay. Okay, now these are some new teachers that came at Bearwald's tenure. Uh, Zucker, Anderson, Nimmer, and Heise. Ten years later, in 1884, we had 265 students. Now, for you teachers here, that means if you were one of those teachers, there were, that meant there were three rooms at this point. That meant 88 per room. Okay? Do you see why listen up and good discipline had to be the rule? You know, today people say, oh, you're not very gospel oriented. It's so law structured and a time for the law and a time for the gospel. And it appears that there was gospel from these guys because when uh, Teacher Bearwald died, they said uh, very much loved by the students that he had. So it doesn't mean because, and, and I didn't want to give the impression at the outset that all this was was law, uh, there was gospel there too. Okay, to cover the cost, teachers' salaries and some other expenses, not to mention the debt that they would ensue. Uh, they charged 65 cents a month, or if you had more than two children, you didn't have to pay more than $1.30 per month per family. So that raised enough money to pay the teachers that $40 a month that uh, they felt they had coming. Arno. Well, because at this time, there were only three classrooms. I had four teachers, but there's overlap. See, one of them was finished, another one took their place. The documentation is not quite as rigid as maybe we might expect. Um, it was, we don't know exactly when, which one bowed out first and which one came in to take their place. Okay, now this is, I know this is really hard to see from the back, but this gives you a little bit of an idea. You notice there's benches, and they put three or four students on a bench in a row like that. That gives you an idea. Uh, we don't know an exact year for this picture, but I thought, and I know it's hard to see, but it gives you a little idea of how, what the classroom was like, and I got a couple like that there. You notice there's like four or five abreast on, on some of those that, and they just sit on those benches. It doesn't even appear that they may have had desks even at the, at the very beginning. And that's from the 1880s, this one. Okay, now uh, I put this in to give you a little bit of the, of the general layout. Now, we didn't talk about the new church yet, but you can see it over to the right. And then that building right in between there is the parish hall. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And that is the school building. And then you can see Eggert's, the store, right next to it. Uh, that gives you, now you say, look at that building. Uh, that other building was kind of like white. On that table over there, you see the Cream City brick. Okay, that's what that was built out of. But what happens to cream city brick when you have an environment of coal and, and coal burning stoves and all that kind of stuff? It gets dirty, right. And you know, a lot of people do tuck pointing or you know, sandblasting to get that new look back. But this is, this is sort of how they looked a few years later. Okay, there's the comparison. That one, same building. 
There it is, a little closer up. Yes. Karen. Yes. Oh, I don't know that. And I don't, John, do you know anything about that? Yeah, because it was right, remember that first picture that showed the church, and then that building behind it. Um, so I think this other business is something different. Yeah, and that looks like a two-story building. I think the black slot w shop was on, only a one. I beg your pardon? No, and there was a remodeling of the basement. Now, I don't know if that entrance had anything to do with it, but uh, they remodeled the basement. And on that list that you have on the handout, I have these things throughout the, but it talks about uh, renovating the basement on there. And what it was $630 to remodel the, oh, wait, that was the blacksmith shop. Um, Number eight, yeah, remodeling the school basement, and that happened in 1945. Judy? When I lived there, the bathroom was worse than the basement. Yes. So what year did they add these in 1945? When they added indoor plumbing? I believe so. And Rich, you had mentioned something about that, right? Because originally, the, the basement was not finished off or anything and and then later after that remodel they had bathrooms there rich you want to describe the bathrooms really okay yeah now imagine Might have had to go down three flights of stairs. Yeah, okay. Um, and I, I remember going to Manitowoc Lutheran High School in an old, old building that was condemned by the city and we did that before building the new building. And they had the same thing. They had bathrooms in the basement and you know, we used to sit in class and go like this and it would make the floors shake and the windows rattle. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, um, later on when they did that renovation, what ended up, they had a place for choir practice down there, and they had a place for confirmation classes, and the bathrooms, and the janitor stuff was down there too. Karen? Yeah, the janitor stuff was directly under the door, and the bathroom was down the hallway. Okay. <laughs> Wally? Well, yes, a little bit later than where we were at. Four were being used. Okay, now, here's what happens. Albert Bearwald dies of a heart attack at age 20. Well, and he was 31 years old. Does that surprise us? Uh, you know, but, you know, when you have 107 kids in one room and now you, got eight, you get up downsized to 88, uh, you know, at the Lord called him home at age 31 with a heart attack. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, in those days, they didn't have the means, you know, somebody has a heart attack today and, uh, you know, they, they know what to do with you. Um, okay, so the congregation then called its middle grade teacher, August Heisey, to be its second principal. August Heisey was called from, now here's a, uh, an instance called from Two Rivers, Wisconsin. Um, they had a big school in Two Rivers, uh, St. John's in Two Rivers, I assume probably. Uh, he was the middle grade teacher. He, taught, he was the principal and upper grade teacher from 1885 to 1909, uh, the year in which he died in the saddle as well. <laughs> All right, this... this Oh, I thought it was a beard. Because he's got a kind of a bow tie thing underneath that. Yeah, maybe it gets a little more grainy when you look at, when you try to blow it up on a slide. Okay. Um, 
This was the faculty. William Dahman in the center uh, was the pastor. Okay, Wiedekind and Thede were the two additional teachers and August Heise was the principal. So at this point, three rooms still. Okay, so there's one room at the school that's not yet being used. Okay, a little bit about Thede taught the third class. See, and the third class doesn't tell us anything about, you don't know if that's a sequential thing and it, when they added it. It doesn't tell us what grades it was really. Uh, he died in 1890 and was replaced by F. Weirtz. I'm gonna have to really speed this up, I think. Uh, Henry Wiedekind was called from New York to teach, a second to teach the second class, from, and he was there from 1885 to 1915. All right, uh, that picture is dated 80, 85 to 90. All right, there's another picture of the, in the 1800s of students in the classroom. Another one there, seems like we had those already kind of like this. Now, here's a little bit of a timeline. In 1891, we were the largest school in the city. Uh, fourth class was added with Mrs. Louise Dahman teaching. All right, um, that, I was thinking when I talked about Dahman's wife before, I was thinking of the kindergarten teacher. This is different. Okay, uh, in 1893, Frederick Kirschman was called to teach the third class, but he was also called, well, no, I take it back. He was called to teach the third class. Okay, 1894, we had 344. That's the max. There's some enrollment statistics on your handout that you can check uh, what the highest and lowest amounts were. Um, 86 people per room still, even with four rooms. Oh, no, when you go to four rooms, it goes down. Then we had, well, and the enrollment went down and the teachers went up, so that adjusted it to 75 per room. Okay. Um, here's Fred, Friedrich Kirschman. Uh, he was a teacher from 1893 to 1909. Uh, St. Jacobi Congregation decided to build a new church in 1901 with a target date of 1905 to begin construction. Okay, initial funding sources. And I'm gonna scoot through this fairly quickly, but because it's tied to what happens with our education process, uh, 25th anniversary raised $754. The kids collected pennies for $250. Uh, the young people paid 10 cents a month, they got $1,200. The ladies' aid paid $250. And then 220 of 484 voters. Uh, there's places that show voters. There was 500 voters at one time in our history. And it seemed like then, it, it must have been that almost every head of household of the family, you were a voting member of the congregation. Um, they pledged $10,450, so there was some pledging in advance here, and there was a, a bequest of $100. Okay, a total of $13,000 to start. All right, the new church was dedicated in 1906. I have the model of it over there. Um, seating capacity, 930. Total cost, $65,000. Artwork was donated by the young people, and the bells, $728, donated by the school children, and one of those bells was 1,600 pounds, the other bell was 1,000 pounds, and they got those, and we still have uh, those bells in our bell tower out here. Imagine the longevity of that gift from kids in a, in a school. Isn't that amazing? Um, maybe somebody here can correct me. I know for sure one of the bells, is it both? Or am I making that up? Yeah, I know there's three out there, but uh, the, the school children bells, are both of them surviving? Yes, okay, that's what I thought. All right, so look at the legacy that those kids, the impact that their donation, at 150 years later, those bells are still being used. Yes? Straight west 
And then there was a jog in it, and at the head of, at 13th Street, the church stood as if that road came to an end. But you had to skirt around the church, and then 13th Street continued. So it was, um, this was right at the head, and I think some of the other pictures will show, oh, now am I going the wrong way? No, I'm not. Um, Kirschman, oh, we did that. Okay, he died, he retired uh, he died in 1942, retired, stayed a member of the congregation. All right. Um, now, if anybody recognizes you or some relative or your parent or anything on here, just wave your hand because I don't know the people on this picture. And nor do I have, and, but that's Mr. Kirschman standing at the side of them to the, to the right. Okay, then uh, declining enrollment started. It, it's ironic. And you know, as much as well, uh, what a great thing was happening and all the blessings that came, uh, doesn't, sort of like our lives, right? It doesn't always mean we're going to be totally uh, what we view as seeing as blessings. Uh, there was a hardship in the congregation at this time, especially in the area of education. Um, look at the enrollment stats, 1894, 30, 344, 1898 to three, uh, there were 300. Uh, then in 1909, now this is only four years after the church was built. Um, well, three years after the church was built, I went down to 232. Sounds nicer for teachers with only 58 in the room, but um, hmm, it's, a, it's a decline in enrollment, okay? So, uh, now here's a picture of some kids in a classroom. Those classrooms look dressed up a little bit more like they, than they did in the 1800s. Um, <laughs> now, this is an interesting picture because I think that we have figured out uh, the name Petty is on the side of the picture, but I think we, could, we figured out who it is. looks just like Rudy. Um, and I only knew him, at, uh, you know, 50 years after this. But, uh, but anyway, oh, probably, yeah, maybe, maybe even 60. Um, all right. There's a picture of the inside of the church. Confirmation classes. Okay, now the causes. I listed some causes for a 20-year decline. First of all, a burden of heavy debt. We said there was a heavy debt for the first church. Now the second church, even more so, because look at the added cost to it. Uh, now, sad to say, offerings, attendance, and interest waned. For some reason, people got discouraged. Sharp enrollment decline takes place. There's all kinds of anti-German feelings. And in, this, in the midst of that, there are no English services in the church. Now, you know, you look at that, what would you do in this situation? First and most obvious, turn to the Lord, look, seek his favor, and, and look for how he would direct you. Some of the writings in the anniversary books and so on, sadly, seem to indicate that People didn't turn to the Lord really with this. They despaired about it a little bit and uh, more and more people dropped out of school and uh, all kinds of things like that that happened. Uh, some other reasons, the quality of education seemed to decline. Uh, some came for confirmation only, not for the rest of the grades. Members started moving away because Mitchell Street was fast becoming a commercial center. Um, there was a failure and, and this that sounds like a harsh statement, but I didn't make it up. It comes out of one of the anniversary books. Um, there was a failure to trust in the Word of God. So in someone's perception, that was there, that uh, we aren't turning to the Lord when we should, and so we give up and do our own thing, and 
the decline was extremely sharp. Now, what kind of solutions do we have for that problem? Uh, Money-making schemes would be the first thing. Uh, tried entertainments of different kinds, you know, charge admission for somebody to come and see stuff. Uh, return to all eight grades. Now, this is the complex. Somebody asked questions about eight grades before. And in the 75th anniversary book, uh, it mentions that all, you know, after the St. Martini Joint School Venture, that it was the first time in St. Jacoby's history that they came back to all eight grades. Well, it makes it sound like they hadn't had all eight grades before. And to be honest, we don't know for sure, but in talking to different people, um, you know, it, it seems like maybe there was a time when there weren't, all of the grades weren't filled. Okay, um, weekly English services, that was a solution. They started that in 1925. Um, seek revenue from other sources. Ex now, here's an interesting one. Accept an offer to sell the property agreed to sell for half a million dollars. They actually had an offer for a half a million dollars. And they were so befuddled by it and apparently not knowing what they should do. So they pondered on it for two or three months or more. And then when they accepted the offer, they said, no, it's too late. Uh, first of all, it's too much money. And second of all, uh, we're not interested anymore. I think it was the city that was uh, uh, the proposed buyer, if I'm remember. I beg your pardon? Uh, that would have, oh. Yeah, I think it was 25. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, now, in the meantime, we call George Denninger. He's the fourth principal, and he, he was principal from 1943 to 1947. He taught in the joint school from 1928 till it was dissolved in 1943. Now, on the back of your handout, I have listed, uh, we have this listed incorrectly in, our, in a couple of our anniversary books, but one of them has it correctly. Um, George Denninger was not the principal from 1928 to 1943, as it says in our new booklet. Um, he really was a teacher that was called to teach in the joint school, and it wasn't until after they decided to dissolve that arrangement that then he became principal. And that's when it says we went back to all eight grades. And, and uh, you know, I had assumed that we had all eight grades before that. But, uh, you know, there must have been a time when we didn't have all eight grades. So, um, there's a picture. Uh, and John Miller helped me figure this out. I wrote the guy's name down. Uh, August Went. Oh, the guy in the hat on the side, not a teacher, but the janitor. Uh, and uh, he's pictured with the school children. Um, and you know, John must be way older than I am because he remembers all that. Uh, okay. <laughs> and there's George Denninger with uh, a class of his kids. And this is after 1931 now. That seems a, a bit out of sequence here, but anyway. Um, now, when we returned to operating our own school with all eight grades in 1943, the enrollment jumped to 88, highest in 30 years. And uh, you know, it also at the same time, they decided to drop this tuition thing. And then some people were all up in arms and like, oh my goodness, the, the school is gonna bankrupt the church. And you know, the Lord blessed the endeavors continuously and the church didn't get bankrupt and the school enrollment started to climb back. Mr. Armin Keibel, and I say Mr., uh, some places he's listed as Pastor Armin Keibel. At the time we called him, he was a candidate for the ministry, must not have quite finished his work at the seminary. Uh, he was called to be the assistant pastor and a seventh and eighth grade teacher. Uh, and that was in 1945. And he was uh, succeeded by Pastor Hilmer in 1946. 
Um, then a kindergarten class was started in 1942. We're not sure if it was 42 or 43. Uh, the documentation doesn't tell us for sure. Um, and Mrs. Nauman, oh, that was Nauman I was thinking of before. Mrs. Nauman was the pastor's wife. Uh, and he had just retired from the ministry and <clears throat> she, well, or took another call. And she a succeed, was, a taught in our school and then was succeeded by Mrs. Clarence Byerly. And Alan, how is that related to you? Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, what is the, your aunt, okay, I had forgotten. And then after her came uh, Lola Manthe Behrens. All right, um, there we picture a class in 1943, notice it's up against the backdrop of the old church. Um, there we have the kids in 1945 inside the church building. Um, and that looks a little like it is now, you know, and we have a Christmas service or something and you put all the kids in the pews. Um, it takes up half the church and, and there's no room for anyone else to sit. Well, those are blessings. All right. <coughs> in 1940s, this picture was taken. Um, and here's kind of a collage with the new church. And um, I think in the parish hall, they had that stage and everything. Um, I, I didn't mention this along the way, but the parish hall was built. Uh, when they took down the, old, the first church, they took the lumber from that and built the parish hall. And at the same time as the new church was being built. Okay. Mr. Armin Kaibo, 45, 46, teacher of grades seven and eight. You don't think that is? Succeeded by, I don't know, I had, we, I had him list, I'll have to look at the pictures again, but in one of the anniversary books, they picture him and say it's Armin Kaibo. They also picture him in a classroom with a bunch of kids. You had him and that's not him. Okay, very good, thank you. Karen. I'm sorry? Someone suggested that was a brother. Oh, okay. Oh, Joyce says uh, Armin did teach at the high school also. Okay. Uh, th now this, this picture was labeled Armin Keibel with a class. And so they have it wrong in one of the anniversary books then. And I didn't mention earlier, you know, of all the anniversary books out there, um, Pastor Langbartels uh, actually translated the 25-year the anniversary and the 50-year anniversary into English, which John forwarded me on, uh, on the computer and I read through it. So thank you for that because all of that stuff would have been in German and I wouldn't have had a clue. Okay. Um, Mr. Raymond Miller was called. Fifth principal, 1947 to 1959, grades six to eight, and not asked for the first time, not asked to lead choir or play organ. Uh, so they separated the principalship from the music directorship. 52, and this is just a, a little fact on the bottom here, 52 of the 148 pupils are from unchurched homes. So they were reaching out into the community uh, while we're trying to build up our own membership back again. Uh, the outreach seemed to be good. Dennis. Yes, there was some English taught in the school by this time. Confirmations were still in German. I think I have some indication of that on the handout. Um, Jane. Okay, and Marion was also a teacher here at St. Jacoby prior to that. And... 
Um, Marion was in a, at Tosa when I student taught there. So interesting. Yes, Joyce. At this point, in 47, Joyce said there was no German anymore. Okay. Yes, probably. Okay. Um, moving right along. Anybody recognize anybody on there? <laughs> yes, Karen. Are you on there? Oh. You changed so much for the good. Okay, I got to get rolling here. Okay, um, a kindergarten class in 1947, um, the kindergarten class in 1950. Who know, does anybody know who that teacher is? That's not Mrs. Glazer, but uh, anybody? No? Okay. Um, another picture of this is all in that school that we looked at. Okay. Um, and now we have desks, okay, that kids are sitting on a bench kind of desk, a lot fewer per room than we had before because the enrollment is considerably down. Um, another picture of that. Um, and this probably in the parish hall because they have that stage there. And Jesus be our guide. I don't know if this is uh, an anomaly or not, but that was a theme for one of the graduating classes during the period of the joint school venture. So I don't know if this goes to that or not. <clears throat> All right, then inside church with the Christmas tree. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Colander became our sixth principal from 1959 to 69. Middle grades, organist and choir director. He's another one that we called as a teacher first. He taught, started in 49. Uh, and he was called not as the principal, but as the um, director and teacher. And he happened to have choir and organ. So then when we needed another principal, he seemed like a likely candidate. So he became the principal, but he, because of his abilities in music, he kept, now all of a sudden, the music goes back to the principalship. Okay, and that becomes an issue later during my tenure. Um, <laughs> A plan for the new school. Currently, current land acquired in 1961 for $32,500. $32, it was built in 1963 for $280,000. All right, there's a picture of it from the back. In the meantime, they, since we have the new school, they raised the, the old one. All right, next principal, Mr. Arlen Kessler, seventh principal, taught from 69 to 78. He taught seventh and eighth grade. He, he remained organist and choir director. Okay, then uh, a picture of a class in the new school in 1973. Uh, then, oh my, I don't know, they were desperate. Uh, but anyway, from 1978 to 2013, I taught seventh and eighth grade just like Arlen did at the beginning and did choir and organ, um, ladies choir and mixed choir for the first 15 years. And then our Board of Education said, uh, you know what, our enrollment is getting, our trend in enrollment kept going up from uh, that low that we saw in the, t in the 20, in 25. And it was like they said, well, would you like to do administration or would you like to stick with the music? And, uh, you know, if you knew my talent in music, uh, I, I said, I'll go with the administration. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, it, it was a fun time, though, uh, choir directing. I just remember when uh, Pam Mansky one time said to me, do you think it would be possible that some of us could play sometime. And at that time, Leona Hauer and I were the only organists, and we played every week, every other week, you know, until we got to Lent, then it was more often. And I thought, wow, of course you can play sometime. And look at Pam is still playing till this day, um, and way more talented than I was. So it was awesome. Okay. And then later, uh, we went to uh, administrator time, and then I taught a few classes. Uh, 
it was during this time that we decided that we needed a school expansion because we were bursting at the seams. There was nowhere to store anything. We had renovated the, uh, what used to be the, <clears throat> the multi-purpose room, we used to call it the council room. Uh, at the end of a hall, it wasn't big enough for a classroom, but we made it work. Uh, we just had no place to go anymore. And so we added the addition, and now as you see it to the right, at a cost of $626,450. Okay, some milestones during those years. Uh, started the 4K class in 1996, and that was led by Peggy Yonke. We started a 3K class in 2003, and that was led by Wendy Soliday. Um, this was new for us, that now later came, became called the ECM Ministry, uh, Early Childhood Ministries, uh, still a major outreach tool for our church. Because, you know, when young families uh, want to have their kids in a setting that they feel comfortable with, they want to be able to do this uh, with confidence, and that is the best way to get members. Wally. What was the old church torn down when you moved here to the church? 19, see, I came in 78. It was torn down in, I think, 76 or 7. 1777. I went to the closing service. I was not called by St. Jacoby yet, but I, my mother-in-law and I went to that service just because there were over a thousand people there. We had church in the gymnasium at the, well, at first we had it in a, in a multi-purpose room, and then as more attendants came, we moved it to the gym. And Friday nights at 315, uh, Oh, at 310, sorry, school was out at 315. 310, we put the eighth graders down there, they wheeled in the altar, they wheeled in the lectern, they put up the stuff, set up all the chairs, and we were ready for Sunday. Okay, um, exploration of special education is an important thing in the development of our education. Mrs. Hauer uh, was instrumental in that. Uh, then we moved from that to a part-time special ed call in 1991. Dorothy Cords was the person who did that. Full-time special ed in 2001. Uh, so providing for special needs for kids is definitely a thing that enhanced our enrollment as well. Okay, those are enrollment patterns since 1978. Notice we, in 2008, we had a peak of 252. Um, we're down a little bit from that now, but part of the peak is adding the 3K class and 4K class and counting those in our enrollment numbers. Okay, Mr. Brian Menching became our ninth principal, 2013 to 2018. Um, the milestones in his administration were Wells School Accreditation. We hadn't been part of that before. The Milwaukee Parental Choice Program was explored and implemented. The Wisconsin Parental Choice Program as well. All these afforded the blessing to extend the gospel and outreach into our community um, at the time. Okay, Mr. Joshua Walker, our 10th principal, 2018 to the present. Project Lead the Way, it was a big milestone there. STEM, um, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, preparing kids for a future uh, in, in industries and things like that. Finished Wells accreditation that was begun in the administration before, finished with exemplary status which is the highest category you can get. ECM and church expansion was explored 2018-19. We raised a million dollars for a down payment. Groundbreaking was in 19, dedication in 2020. Um, there it is, $4.2 million. Notice how the numbers change as we move along in time. Uh, our prayers were answered with that expansion. Um, which was a, both a church expansion and a school expansion. Again, seeing how the two are interwoven uh, for education. Those are some pictures of the rooms down there. And that concludes 150-year history of God's grace in Christian education conducted at our school from 1873 to 2023. To God be the glory. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry we don't have a little bit more time for questions because we've run over by about five or six minutes. So um, 
but I don't know if anyone has any comments or anything to add as we dismiss, but you're welcome to if you would. Uh, Paul. Oh yeah, and I was going to make mention of the fact, I think uh, Gilbert Mansky's album back there, which became part of our archives, uh, just a really beautifully done uh, history from beginning to as far, you know, that uh, take a look at that book, it's really interesting. Um, we should probably have that around somewhere uh, afterwards, um, even beyond today for, for your viewing. Okay, thank you. Thank you.